What is up, y'all? Welcome back to the First Million Podcast. I'm so excited for today's episode and wanted to hop on and do a little bit of an intro before we dive in with our guest. I have not done a guest podcast episode in so long. I feel like it's been almost a year. I had a stint at the end of last year where I feel like I was doing a ton of guest podcast stuff. And then I kind of just got into a new vibe with the pod, stopped doing that. But I still have my few girls in the business, the online business community that are on my team or have been connected with me in some way that like really freaking inspire me so much. And today we have one who makes just the very tip top of that list. Her name is Sarah. If you don't know Sarah, um, I have done an episode with her before. I will link that down below. But this is going to be a totally different kind of direction. Sarah just got back from a six month, I believe, stint of living in Bali by herself, which was so freaking cool. She is like my kindred spirit, like digital nomad girly. So I'm so excited to hear from her today. I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a backstory on how Sarah and I first got connected and what our story is as a team and as friends before we dive into having her on, because I think it's just a little bit more organic to dive into the conversation with a guest that way. But Sarah and I first got connected Almost three years ago, she was in one of the very first cohorts of my signature program, Foundations of Online Coaching, which if you guys follow me on Instagram or know anything about what I do as a business mentor, that is my 12-week really intensive group and one-on-one like hybrid program where I'm working really closely with a group of women who are starting online businesses, teaching them my method, you know, showcasing all my resources, like really getting them up and off the ground in a three month period. It is super dope. There is a wait list for the upcoming cohort of that program, which will be in the new year down below. You get a big discount and first dibs on spots. So definitely check that out. The details are there as well. But Sarah was a very early member of that program and We worked together. She did so amazing. She really just like thrived with the information that I taught. And we also were on such a good wavelength together. We continued working together in a one-on-one capacity. So she actually continued working with me for months after that mentorship as her business continued to grow. And I was offering her counsel and mentorship and education on higher level stuff, which was amazing. I do that inside my one-on-one mentorship, which is also linked below if you're curious about applying for that. So we were connected for a while and essentially what happened was Sarah messaged me one day. Um, I was actually out of town with my family and she messaged me and was like, basically, hey, um, my account is going viral. (laughs) And I'll kind of let her give some context as to what she does. But the kind of content that she creates is so powerful and poignant. And basically she had a post that went absolutely viral, millions of views, Um, I would assume that she would categorize that as a life-changing day for her and it was so awesome to see and we continued to work together to just help her balance this newfound like huge set of eyes that were on her and she has hundreds of thousands of eyes on her now across her profiles. Um, Her Instagram handle, her TikTok name, all that jazz is at Sarah in yellow. I will put that down below. But she's truly amazing. She is changing the world with her take on um, body acceptance, body positivity, uh, body neutrality. She has so many different messages that she shares. And I'm really interested to see how she defines her business as it is today. Um, So we'll hear that from her. She's been an amazing friend of mine. She has transitioned and evolved into an amazing teammate of mine as well. She's been a member of my co-coaching team for several years now, meaning that she comes and hosts specialty trainings for my clients inside the Foundations of Online Coaching program, which is really special because that is where she got started, as well as hosting specialty trainings with my one-on-one mentees on topics like lead generation and launch development um curriculums that we've you know collaborated on together and she's just really amazing as an asset to my clients and she's also been a really amazing friend to me when it comes to being able to relate on travel and being a digital nomad and she's just been on the craziest coolest adventure so I'm so excited to share with you guys a little bit about her story I have some really funny kind of you know deep but also very like humorous topics that I want to discuss with her questions that I have about her journeys I know that she 
communicated to me before the episode that she wanted to talk a little bit about some different restructuring and things that she's doing in her business and to kind of pick my brain about that. So I imagine we'll do a little bit of like live coaching on the call as well. But I have a really fun agenda for the day. I hope you guys love the episode. Make sure and check us both out on Instagram. Again, it's at Emily Woods Wellness and at Sarah in Yellow. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit subscribe and like this video if you want me to do more guest speaker collab type of vibes more than happy to accommodate y'all just let me know um and you can feel free to shoot me a dm on instagram if you ever have someone specific that you'd like me to chat with but without further ado let's get sarah on here and dive into the episode hi so excited for today um i really don't think i've like actually talked to you like obviously we text and we talk on boxer i don't think i've actually talked to you since like we haven't had a call since before you left for Bali. I don't like, I don't think I ever talked to you when you were there. We talked one time. We literally like FaceTimed one night because they were just like, oh my God. Yes. I remember. And he was like rearranging the living room or something. Like, that. Yeah, no, I do remember that because then my husband was like, why don't we, why aren't we in Bali? Why don't we go to, why do we only go to Europe? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I have addiction. What can I say? a problem um but no so I already like I said I did a little bit of an intro but we're kind of gonna proceed as if people listening today have not listened to our last episode and I think a lot has changed so I kind of gave a little bit of a rundown of just how we got connected and everything so can you why don't you just like bring us up to speed you who you are what your business is about um and kind of um you know, even a little bit from your perspective just you know how we got connected what our connections like right now and then we'll get into the fun stuff Yes. So where do I even start? Um, I'm a full-time coach. I go back and forth between calling myself a health coach and a life coach because it's both. It's everything. Um, I specialize in long-term sustainable, realistic wellness habits, mostly for women, um, but not exclusively and through the lens of body image. So really finding confidence in ourselves and what we look like and having mental and physical habits that honor that. As far as when we got connected, you're going to have to help me out because I think it's been like three years or is it? That's what I was saying. I think it's definitely been more than two years because we were working together for like not a whole year, but I mean, it would have been close to together in March of 2021, I think. Yeah. So we've been talking. I remember literally you DM'd me on Instagram in January of that year. So January of 2021, we have been in contact. Um, Yes, that must have been when it was because it was post. It was when I was finishing my health coaching certification. So yeah. So since the very beginning of 2021, so almost three years now, which is so crazy that we've known each other that long. um, I know. I feel like we've both watched each other go through so many different launches and changes in our business and changes in our lives and all the good things. Um, But yeah, so we got connected because I think you followed me on Instagram and I definitely told this story on our last podcast episode. But from my perspective, I was very new to the coaching world, wasn't even done with my certification yet. And I was like, okay, this girl's like in my DMs. She seems super sweet. Um, She's a business coach. I don't really know much about what that means, but like she definitely shares a lot of like stuff that's really valuable to me. Like, I feel like I am so excited to be a coach, but I have no idea what I'm doing. And then we started DMing and I was like, I, I didn't even understand, even though I was in my health coaching certification, like, I really feel like I didn't even understand like how coaching worked at that point. So I was like, Hey, she wants to get on discovery call. I don't really know what that means. Like, is this a scam? And we talked the shock, the shock when someone's like, do you want to get on a video call with me from the internet? It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like um no thank you no um, thank you no but I remember DMing you because I was like fresh out of college and I graduated in May of the pandemic like so I graduated in the pandemic height of it um so I was like hey I'm I have no money I know that I can't hire you right now I would love to talk and pick your brain but you know have no expectations and you were like yeah sure fine let's get on a call um And yeah, I remember just us really getting along really well, just having a lot to talk about. I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, like this person knows so much of what I want to understand and feel confident in. And then long story short, um, we ended up working together. I joined your group program first. So we did that together in March of 2021. And I remember really enjoying that because it gave me so much structure as I was finishing my certification. I 
signed my first clients in that time. It was so nice to have somebody supporting me, answering my questions, um, rooting for me in the beginning stages of your business when you feel like a nobody who has no idea what's going on. It's so helpful. Um, and then we took a little bit of a break at the end of the group program. And then I was like, I want one-on-one. -on -one. I want to keep going. I feel like I learned so much, but I have so much more that I want to know that I want to practice. And so then we did that together. We did one-on-one -on -one for a while. And then I feel like since then, that would have been the end of 2021. Um, yeah, the past like year and a half, I feel like we've been in each other's spheres. Like you've helped me with copywriting and launch design. I do these podcasts with you. I run some of your one-on-one -on -one and your group coaching. We have one tonight that I'm running. Um, and we've been just like really nice additions to each other's business since then. And my business has grown. My presence on social media has grown, which you have been like with me as a friend and a coach through that, which has just been like crazy. I don't even know how else to describe it. It's just okay. insane. Just like, you know, you never know what tomorrow is going to bring, but some days, like, I think you texted me one day and you were like, your Instagram is blowing up right now. Like what is going on? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, why are like kids from my little high school in my little town texting me about you? And I'm like, first of all, why are y'all talking to me? Second of all, what the hell is going on? <laughs> Yeah, no, like insane. And like the arc, because obviously like and y'all listening, I told everybody like I'll link the last episode we did um, to this episode and we'll reference it and everything. But I know we kind of got into that journey on our last um, episode, but it's just been really cool. It's obviously a big deal. Like for when you work with someone, when I work with someone who like gets it so intensely that I'm able to then like bring you into the fold as like someone who can work directly with my clients. It's a very like unique thing. It's yeah, it's been um, a huge asset to my business. All my clients obviously like now especially are so excited to meet you and hear from you. And it's just a really cool thing. And the unique experience of like you being in a program and then getting to help women like tonight, it'll be like 12 women who are like ready to you know learn and who will start businesses and already have businesses and have kids and like it's just this whole thing where the ripple effect is so major but yeah it's a small world not small enough for us to have met in person which is really the weirdest thing because I will in my mind like when I think about it I'm like no I've met her but I'm like no I haven't <laughs> like I I super have not but one of these days were and I know when we hang out in person it's not gonna be like a weekend thing it's gonna be like a we need to rent a house and work side by side for like a month like yeah that's the vibe that, that's the thing yeah we need to yeah exactly let's rent like a big nice house somewhere really special <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're going to be like, oh, holy shit, she's hyper and loud. This is crazy. I know you're going to need to go. It's going to be that. Then you're going to go need to like meditate for another additional month. But <laughs> no, it'll be I know when that does happen, it's going to be so amazing. And I am like I the curiosity that I have, like the questions that I have about your trip. And I'm sure you've been absolutely bombarded with questions. I'm sure that people have just wanted to know everything, but I'm, I'm like, no, like I need to know because obviously I like the digital nomad thing. That's like my thing. I'm obsessed. People who do that, I think are so cool watching like the first very like public digital nomads on YouTube, I think transformed literally my entire life and was the biggest deciding factor in me getting my health coaching certification. And to have you go do something so neat to change your whole life, you know, go through the breakup, go through the move, go to this other country. I, I, and yeah, I literally was obviously just shook when you were doing that. And I was so intrigued and I still am. And you're back. So, okay, let's just like dive into your trip a little bit because I definitely, and we'll timestamp everything. So if you just care about the business stuff, like that'll be, we'll get to that in a second, but we'll definitely get to the business part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. live the life of your dreams regardless of if that's being a full-time digital nomad like me like this is so instrumental to it like working yeah. your business and your lifestyle together flawlessly yes. is yeah absolutely essential regardless of what your lifestyle looks like oh 
A hundred percent. Like it puts you in the driver's seat of your entire life versus like you literally getting like drug behind the car. I swear. Like it is, it's so transformative to be in a career where you have that control. Um, yeah, I, it's so neat that I like have you to even talk to about this. I really personally don't have people in my own life that do stuff like this. Like I'm very much the black sheep, like all my neighbors, like, oh my God, they're home. Like (laughs) nice of them to show up and mow the yard. No, but it's so fun to know someone who does cool things like this and does something alternative. So give us like a little preview, like how long were you gone? Walk us through the agenda. I mean, I just want to know like kind of a preview of your trip. And then I have some questions specifically about like the first month of your travels and just like the integration part so like start us off with the rundown and we'll dig deeper from there yes and the questions are great because it was it's six months like that's a long time yeah, and a long it's time. so completely different than than everything else I've known before living in America and so I love the questions because when someone's like tell me about your trip I'm like where do you even want me to start like it's been the last oh literally me I'm like it was good bye <laughs> it was good how's the food good um but yeah, so leading up to it, I'd been in my business full time for at least like a year and a half. I have no timeline of my life, like a year and a half, I would guess, maybe more. Oh, yeah, um, I think and, at least, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I had ended my relationship with a partner of four years, like live in partner, um, like same house, had cats together, the full nine yards. Um, you know, that you end up in when you're 24 and he's an incredible person. Our life trajectories are just on completely different routes, i.e. me moving to Bali and him working at the local bank. Like we are both very happy, but we are very different. And it was clear that our lives are going in different directions as much as we loved each other. And so I left that relationship because I wanted to go to Bali And I didn't want to have to book a return ticket. And I knew that this person wasn't going to be able to come with me, you know, physically with their job or emotionally, like it was the life they wanted. So I was like, okay, I'm at a breaking point in my life where a turning point, I suppose. Um, I have built this business to be remote because I've known that I wanted to live this. I wanted travel to be a big part of my life for probably the last decade, like probably since I was in early high school, I was like, that is the kind of life I want, even if I didn't understand how it's going to make it happen yet. So like I've built the successful business. I've worked really hard on it to be able to do things like this. And now I feel a little bit trapped. And so I ended that relationship. Um, it was very hard. Don't recommend having to move out of the home of somebody that you've loved if you don't have to. It wasn't fun. Um, I actually saw him the other day for the first time in six months though. and. He's really good. We're really good. We we were friends for a long time before we like saw him intentionally or ran into him. Oh, you okay? Okay, that's good. Oh my god, I thought you're like no, I was in Trader Joe's. We ran into each other. No, <laughs> did that's a whole other thing. Like coming back to a small hometown, I had to text him before I came home and was like, hey, I will be home because we live in such a small town that like, can you imagine like your ex girlfriend just like effing off can I imagine all my ex-boyfriends living here yes I can and I that's why I'm like I'm going I'm going permanently like gotta go yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) he's like fully moved on it's like I don't want to walk into the grocery store and unexpectedly see you but anyway um I make it sound so simple but I ended that relationship moved out of our house talked about who was going to care for the cats, all the things, very challenging. Um, oh and now God. that we're past it, I'm like, you know, it was survivable. Him and I are both good individually and our friends. So it's all fine, but it was very hard. And I still, through all of that, like never had a moment where I was like, this isn't the right thing for me. So where I booked a ticket a few months out, I left in the end of January of this year of 2023. Um, And I booked a one way to Indonesia, Bali. Um, And if you are unfamiliar, because I literally had to look at it on a map before I went, um, Bali is a small ish island in Indonesia, which is comprised of thousands of islands. Indonesia is really close to um, Vietnam and Thailand and Singapore and Cambodia. And it's like northwest of Australia, south west of China so it's kind of in this funky spot like Southeast Asia where it's like still definitely Asia but not the kind of Asia you'd picture when you think of like a big city in China or Japan 
And I, even though I did all the reading, I actually had a friend there that answered a lot of questions for me before I came. I still had no idea what to expect. Um, but I took a 16 hour flight to South Korea from Boston. It was why do I still remember watching your Instagram stories that day and being like, I am praying, I am praying for this girl. Like, oh my God, no. I was nervous, <laughs> but it was actually okay. Like, it took off at 11 in the morning. I still remember this. Took off at 11 in the morning. So I was like, I'm going to get a full night's sleep before this. Like, there's no shot that I'm even going to be like tired enough to rest. And I went through like three, five ish hour cycles of like nap watch a movie, read a book, nap, watch a movie, read a book. Like, I think I read like a a book and a half on the flight. I watched like three movies. I took three good naps and it was fine. Um, And then I had a second flight that was eight hours from Seoul to Dempasar, which is the- That would have broken me. That would have broken me in half. Like there, if they would have said, okay, now eight hours. It felt so short though. I was like, this is a breeze. And I flew Korean air. Um, They- I've never been fed so much. Like they gave me like over the two flights, over the 24 hours of flying, probably like five meals and four snacks. Like I was collecting bananas because that was like the vegetarian snack option. I was like, I literally can't eat this much. Um, And I eat a lot, I eat plenty. So yes, I was really well fed. I had a whole row to myself on that first flight. So I had three pillows, three blankets, like, you know, we were good. And then I got there. And it was like three in the morning and I was like, okay, I'm probably going to sleep for like the next day and a half. I'm going to like request a late checkout because I'm only staying in this Airbnb by the airport for one night. Then I'm going to this village where again, I have no idea what to expect where I'm going to live for a month at this guest house. I booked on Airbnb that who knows if it's actually even like what it says it is. And I remember sleeping like five hours. I woke up at like 8 a.m., which I'm not an early riser. And it's also a 13 hour time difference. So yeah, my sleep schedule was just whack. And I was like, all right, might as well get a, get on with it. And I called up a taxi driver that had picked me up at the airport the night before. Very nice man. Um, I was nervous coming from America because like, now that I'm back, I have to get used to like, looking over my shoulder when I like go on a walk at night in America like it's just Bali is for the most part like very safe and the people are very community oriented and loving so like I felt so safe with this like middle-aged man that was driving me like two and a half hours um in his taxi that he just like picked me up in the morning and took me and that was like my first experiences in Bali and it was just really positive he had so many questions for me he was so nice He literally stopped on the way to get me a SIM card because he was like, you need a phone that works. Like we'll stop on the way. You don't know where to go and like helped me get it. And then like five different times was like, are you hungry? Are you hungry? Um, And I wasn't hungry. We didn't stop for food, but (laughs) you you still had all those bananas. You were working your way through the airplane bananas. (laughs) I had all those bananas. And yeah, he got me to my first guest house where I was for a month and carried my suitcases in for me, which I only brought one little suitcase. I lived with a very limited wardrobe the last six months. Um, And I don't even care about clothes, but you will go crazy. And the rest is history. And the rest is history. So you get to your Airbnb and you're like, and it's there. Like first when the Airbnb exists, (laughs) like it's not a scam. Nice. Like it was way nicer than I expected. Which is such, like, like, so huge, obviously, which, like, you would hope. I mean, Airbnb is a well-known platform, but I've definitely stayed places where, like, they were not what all, what they were all cracked up to be. Um, Third world country, like, you you never know. Right, and you're like, yeah, you just, you have no idea. So you get there. So I want to hear from you because I can imagine it is, like you said, so hard to, like, describe a six-month trip in a nutshell. But the things that I... I always wonder about when people do these big solo trips and the part of my bigger travels that is the most impactful is like the first few weeks. You're trying to like, especially for you being by yourself, you're trying to meet friends to know like where the heck to go. So I'm sure there was some intense culture shock and you obviously didn't know anyone. You knew Becca. So you guys, we have a mutual, well, Becca was a client of mine. She's a friend of yours. Like we all kind of know each other. Um, And she was over there, but she was not in your like immediate vicinity she wasn't like waiting there yeah yeah so 
I'm like remembering seeing you on your Instagram, like learning how to drive like a scooter in like traffic and like all of these things. So how did t- just give me your like your synopsis of your first, I'm going to say two to four weeks. You're like meeting people. You're trying to get around, trying to understand like how to, I mean, I just, you're just, it's just you. So what was like that? Like who was your first friend? Like what was all that? Oh my gosh. Oh my God. Who was my first friend? friend well Becca was already there which was great but again she was like an hour away and then she moved a little bit closer and it was only like half an hour but I only saw her twice or three times in Bali before she eventually went to Thailand so like I went to Bali because in theory I had a friend and it made me feel safer to go to a country where I I knew someone but she wasn't close to me and yeah she left after not that long so some of my first friends were in that first guest house I stayed in so I booked this room for a month um So the end of January to the end of February, which is rainy season in Bali. So the room that I had, it's probably like one of the best guest houses that I've stayed in, in my whole Bali experience, probably stayed in like five or six at this point. And it was just like one big, very empty, but like white room, like, like wood furniture, like light wood and white walls. So it was very like aesthetic, very pretty. I had my own bathroom, which was great. Um, and I had like these little like French doors that opened out to like a little kind of like porch patio vibe with all of these like beautiful tropical palm frond kind of things like giving me a little bit of privacy and it was rainy season so I would wake up at 5 a.m. because Bali doesn't have um, summer winter they have rainy dry so rainy is American winter and um our summer is their dry season, which is also the high season because it's not raining. So everyone comes to visit, but it's pretty much 85 degrees every single day. And the sun rises at six and sets at six approximately the whole year. Um, cause it's on the equator, which is very strange. Um, it's a little bit like groundhog day in that way. Um, like every day can start to blend together, but I don't know. I loved it, but I had this private little patio and it's rainy season. So I would wake up at like 5 a.m with I've never heard rain that hard like it rains so hard that you actually on the ground floor are like I feel like I'm gonna wash away like it's so loud that it it wakes everybody up it downpours for maybe like 30 minutes at 5 a.m and then it downpours for maybe like 45 minutes at 7 a.m and then it doesn't rain again until the end of the day and it does the same thing twice in the evening and that's kind of the cycle of rainy season so I was in this place where I was like, I don't know anybody. I kind of know how to get around, um, but I can't take myself anywhere. Cause like you mentioned, I had to learn to drive a scooter. Everybody rides scooters in Bali. You don't take cars. Like I had taken a car to get to that guest house. It took two and a half hours when it should have taken an hour. It's, you don't drive cars. The roads are tiny. The roads are broken. Everybody drives scooters. I was terrified. Um, Yeah. And my first friends were in that guest house because I really spent probably the first like week just getting settled, like just getting comfortable cooking in the communal kitchen and talking to people, which like brute force, you just have to start conversation. Um, But it was really cool because everybody at that guest house was from a different country. I don't think I met a single other American when I was there, which was so refreshing. And I have friends from so many different countries in the world now. And that guest house was really special because the village I was in is really like the one where people go to vacation and go out and party. And that's not really my vibe. And everyone there was like a little family. Um, We were all there at the same time. And as we all started to leave, people that came in to replace us, like, it didn't carry that same community. So we all felt really lucky to have met each other at that time and had a few, like a month that where we all overlapped. Um, but yeah, one of my first friends was a girl and her boyfriend. Um, she's from the UK. He's from Serbia. And so I think I've maybe told you about them. Like some of the most beautiful people I've ever met physically and inside like they're literally a model just gorgeous <laughs> models like that is their job like they're literally models and they're just two of the most like amazing people I've ever met and they have a really beautiful relationship um and we bonded over like the cats in the guest house I was like I gotta start a conversation somehow so I just chatted up about the stray cats that live there and she was a cat person too and the rest is history there The first time I went grocery shopping, that was like very much a culture shock thing. Um, I had to ride one of those scooters. They have like the equivalent of Uber in Bali is like 
Grab or Gojek, and it's just two apps where you can book a scooter or a car. But you book a scooter and someone comes pick you up. Little Indonesian man will come pick you up. It's like one US dollar to go 10 or 15 minutes, which is so affordable. Um, and this tiny little man picked me up. I like held on to him. Like I was so scared on the back of the scooter. Took me to the grocery store and it was like a normal enough grocery store as far as what I would consider normal being from America. But I just couldn't get over like how little processed food they had. And also like all of the different like fruits and vegetables that like we just don't have here because we live on the other side of the world. And I remember being like, wow, like they have different flavors of Doritos and they have like yeah. mangoes for like 30 cents. And like, you know, like they have, I don't know, all these different eggs and all the, the weirdest little things were just so different and in interesting to me that I remember the carrots were like insanely large. I was like, I've never seen a carrot <laughs> this big. Like it was just so funny. Um, and that's a lot of the first month, honestly, is just the little things that we are so used to in life, like how to get around, how to eat, how to cook, where to go, how to make friends. It was a lot of the basics and it was so fun and interesting because the most basic things were like brand new to me and it was really cool. One of my favorite things about traveling is going to grocery stores in different countries. I don't know why that is. I think it is so much fun. I'm very much the mom of any group that I'm in. So I'm like, I'll cook dinner and breakfast and lunch and I'll have a snack crew in my bag and like I'll go shopping. <laughs> and I love that because it's such like a childlike joy to be like just intrigued by the littlest things where like here in America, you're in like these big fluorescently lit like do you guys have Costco where you like, do you go to Costco? You know what Costco is. I live in a very small town. And it kind of oh my God. It is like the definition. It is like the most overstimulated, like I'll be in like Paris or in London or whatever on like the, you know, the little corner store and you're getting just what you need for the day. And then you're back here and you're in the grocery store buying enough to feed a freaking army. And it's like the most overstimulating like situation of all time um and that's not even to be a hater like it is literally just the way that it is but I totally agree with you I think it's so like unique and it just makes you such a more cultured person and also a well-rounded person to be able to like well remember that obviously everyone's day-to-day -day lives are not the same but to be able to find joy in the little things like that and I think travel reminds you of that it just like it just jerks you right back into the moment with those little things which I think is really really neat so that's all like I think the it reminds me a lot of like hostels like staying in a guest house and you're you're with people and I've met some of my greatest like international friends in those environments and it is hard to put yourself out there and start conversations but people are so nice people that travel like in particular are seemingly open like so open yeah. to connection because they're all traveling too like yeah yeah it's it's it was very I've always had a lot of ease connecting with people and making friends like that is like a, a strong quality that I have but even so like if you put a little bit of effort in like you will make friends when you travel oh yeah a hundred percent and you can keep them it's again if you put that effort in after and you you stay in touch like it can they can be lasting friendships so that's super neat on the topic of grocery shopping and food you may not recall but when we were FaceTiming in my kitchen at like 9 p.m. before you left and I'm sitting there and I'm like, Sarah, I'm so happy for you. And like this, and my husband's like, we need to do this. And I'm like, but I have one fear <laughs> and it's, and I, and it's Bali belly. <laughs> and I literally, and I, that's something, again, I was brought up, I think in college when I discovered like YouTube and I'm watching all of like the vegan YouTubers living in Bali, like living on fruit and like living this vibrant, beautiful lives that was so enticing to me. But that was like the one common thread people. And I think that's a an very probably unfortunate like thing that people hear about traveling to Bali. Um, but it, that can happen. You, know, you can get sick from traveling anywhere. But I know that you were talking on Instagram about your experience with that. So like, let's talk about it because <laughs> I'm so... Like, how long did it take you before you were down bad? <laughs> um, okay, well, just for anybody that doesn't know what we're talking about, Bali Belly is basically just like your run-of-the-mill stomach bug that you get from food. Um, in my experience, I would say I had like a medium bad case of it the first time, which was definitely the worst. I had it three times. Um, 
The second and third, not nearly as bad. Um, also, it's kind of sad, but you got to get used to it in a way. Like if it's not too mm -hmm. terrible, you're like, mm, my stomach's just a little bit off th these couple of days. Um, but yeah, so to be frank, like you get a really bad stomach infection that gives you a lot of diarrhea and makes eating really hard, makes stomach cramps really painful and some people throw up I haven't um but yeah you basically get it from eating contaminated food or contaminated water like food that was washed with contaminated water because you can't drink the tap water in Bali um they have a lot of filtered water but yeah you can't drink the tap so being in America I'm like oh my god I can fill my water at the tap again I don't have to like plan my whole day around when I'm gonna be able to get water so it's great but yeah I was down pretty bad the first time. Um, the thing with Bali Belly is people say like you get it from food or water, but it takes at least a few days to set in. So by the time that you are feeling the symptoms, like, I mean, unless you actively went out of your way to eat something like really sketchy, like you're not going to actually know what you got it from. I've heard a lot of people say like, oh, it's definitely from this or it's definitely from that when I ate it. Um, but you really can't know. Like I've gotten Bali Belly from the local restaurants. Absolutely. Like maybe they use contaminated water because Indonesian people are a little bit more immune to the chemicals or the, um, the bacteria in the water. But I've also gotten it from like Western restaurants, like the ones that I'm eating avocado toast and pancakes at, you know, it's, I've gotten it from food that I don't, I don't eat meat. I don't eat anything sketchy. Like I've still gotten it. So you never really know, which I think that for some people, they can get so in their heads about it that they're like so nervous and they limit themselves in what they eat. And I was like that in the beginning. And then I was like, eh, screw it. I'm just going to eat what I want. But the first time I got it, I had it for probably like five days for like three of those days. I like did not come out of my room because my stomach cramps were so bad. And I don't get really bad period cramps, but it reminded me kind of like that, where like when I do get bad period cramps, it's like, it doesn't just hurt in my uterus. It makes me so nauseous and it makes my entire back ache because it's all kind of in that one part of our body. It was like that. Um, and then going to the bathroom was very uncomfortable as well. But the other thing with Bali is like, you can bring things to set yourself up for like, recovering faster um so I had activated charcoal which you can buy at any pharmacy um and it just like neutralizes your stomach acid and just it's kind of like um like Tums in a way like it just settles your stomach a bit and kills some bacteria and um I had Benadryl to like help myself go to sleep and just bring down a little bit of inflammation and I had like anti-diarrhea medication and then you just drink as much water as you can. For some people, it's hard to keep water down. Um, but the other thing in Bali that I learned over time is it's a lot more affordable than the United States. So something like having a nurse come to your house and give you an IV drip for fluids and electrolytes is like $30. Like, so a lot of people do that when they get Bali Belly and they bring this special fluid sack that has like all the things you need to recover faster and you can do that so like if you really are are really bad like some people do go to the hospital but it's mostly from dehydration I think um yeah. so yeah that was my first experience I could literally only keep down like dragon fruit which a lot of people say not to eat produce when your stomach sensitive like that but like I couldn't keep bread down um and yeah, the second and third time I had it, yeah, I was just like, mm, something's not feeling great in my stomach. As soon as I eat, I had to like run to the toilet for a couple of days. And I don't know. Other than that, Remember like that? I survived. I I don't think it's a good enough reason not to go to Bali um, because you can get a really bad stomach bug anywhere. I got the stomach bug all the time when I was little. Like it is Bali belly because it's that, that contaminated water. Um, but any water you get like at a guest house like they're going to have like a big bubbler just like in an office building for you to fill your your water cups in you can cook with that too um any water you get in restaurants is going to be like water or ice made with filtered water like they know that because they're serving tourists um yeah you know be yeah. reasonably careful know that it'll probably happen to you at some point and that it'll be okay Right. And you'll survive. Yeah. I totally think I was like laughing at myself when I said that to you the first time too, because it is something you hear about. But like, I, 
I love like I love Greece, for example. Like I love yeah. going to Greece. And like my cousins are there right now in the same place that we always go together and they all have water poisoning. So I'm like, you know, you you, you win some, you lose some. It's it's hard to predict, but I think you're you're very brave. <laughs> but that's, you know, you're just it's again it's like you just be independent and, and take care of yourself and obviously like bringing precautions and stuff with you um i was more so just curious kind of what that experience was like but um another thing before we dive into like the business side of things so you were sharing a little bit on your instagram story about just being in bali and like meeting not only like girl friends but also meeting guys and i like need to know the like tea did you have a like a bali boyfriend <laughs> like, what are, like what are we dealing with here i'm like so intrigued also i'm like i'm trying to remember if you had said you were like using like dating apps or i it, you were gone for so long and i had i tried as much as i could to keep up with your content um but yeah what's the tea what's on, the tea on the bali love life <laughs> um i have so much i could share again six months is a long time um and I don't know how deep we want to go into my experiences. How about pick your favorite? Pick your favorite or your least favorite. Like your funniest. I don't care. I just need something. Just give me something. <laughs> the worst possible. <laughs> um, yeah, I was on dating apps. I had Bumble and Hinge. At the very end, I got Tinder because I was okay. bored. Like literally three days before I left. Um, but yeah, Bumble and Hinge because I like something a little more serious, a little more deep um and I met a lot of really great people um one of the experiences I had with a good person who wasn't good for me was we went to dinner we had a first date I met him on Bumble we had a great first date we like got drinks one place this is my second month in Bali I'm in a different village than the first one um this person owns a couple restaurants in the area and we have a great first date we get like drinks one place that he recommends and then dinner another place like I was like I love pizza he was like I know a great place for pizza um it was hard to find good pizza in Bali that was really good pizza um and then we got dessert somewhere else and I was like okay this is a great first date and then we had a second date and I asked him like oh yeah do you want to like get dinner again like you know you pick the place because I'm not from here and he's lived here for a few years and he's like <laughs> I didn't so oh my god what what did he say to you <laughs> we had a great first date that's the thing and he the set like before our second date is like yeah, but like, don't get used to me paying for everything because I'm not into like that kind of situation. And women have used me before just because like I, I own restaurants in the area. They think I'm just going to pay for everything. Like, I hope that's not what you're trying to get out of this. And I was like, whoa, whoa. Like, no, lit. that is the biggest no thank you I have ever heard in my life. What the hell? Yeah. And don't get me wrong. Like he paid for our first date. We went to three different places. Like he paid for all three. We had a conversation at the drinks place, the first place we went. And I was like, do you want to split it? Like, do you want me to offer to pay? Like, I'm very frank. Like, I was like, do you want me to, do you want me to try to oppose gender roles? And he was like, no, please let me pay for it. Like, I was very happy to be the one swiping his card on our first date. And also we're in Bali. He's from India. I'm from America. Like he's got plenty of money. Like, let me just leave it at that. Like we're not racking up a trek in this third world country like maybe it's expensive for bali but it's not it's very much affordable for us like i did not break the bank we shared a tiramisu um yeah so that was before our second date and i was like you know what i'm gonna chalk this up to his past traumas and i said to him i was like you need to process that on your own next time i think is what i said like you need to never literally let me hear you say those words ever again asshole oh my god <laughs> because I'm so down to to split a check or to like alternate but after like the first two dates yeah we're absolutely gonna do that the first two though you can pay because when we close the the gender pay gap then that'll be one thing and also like I'll start going back and forth paying when I realize that this is like a consistent thing yeah mm -hmm. and so I gave him the benefit of the doubt and we had like a really nice second date too um and like I saw him for a couple weeks and then 
moved on and was like, that was a really good learning experience for the type of man I do and don't want to date in the future. Um, Mm -hmm. So it was a really good learning experience about what I um, will never accept someone saying to me ever again. (laughs) Literally ever again. Oh my God. The audacity of men. I love that. (laughs) I like, I have these quips about men. I'm literally married to like the nicest like man I, of literal all time, but I'm out here aggressive about <laughs> men, I swear. Yeah. Because it's not the men, it's the misogyny that we're- No, exactly. It's not the men. I know incredible yeah. men, but we live in a patriarchy and there's a lot of misogyny. As women in business, let's not even deny it. Like, yeah. I know. I know. And they annoy me. And the annoyance, it just boils over sometimes. I just can't. Okay. I had to ask. I was like, I need to know- the details of <laughs> I need to know what was happening but really good experiences like dating in Bali has been I think just this period of my life that I'm in um I've had amazing experiences too like the best fill in the blank like the best yeah. dates the best you know what like the best yeah yeah one list the first the best casual things the best friends that are men that I met on dating apps and we're like maybe we're not you know compatible in that way the best people to have crushes on like I had so much fun and I learned so yeah. much. But yes, that is an yeah. experience that sticks out to me as like, whew, rough. Yeah, like literally never again. Oh my God. Okay, well, thank you for sharing. I, I had to know. Okay, so I am so excited to dive into the business part of this because this is the thing that like I personally get asked the most about. Like if I'll do like a multi-month Europe trip and I'm also working and I'm – because. I, I'm interested to hear your take on like time zones and things too, because these are questions that I get that I oftentimes have a hard time answering because I will put myself through crazy schedules or weird hours or whatever it is just to make it work. Cause kind of like you were saying when you, at the beginning of the episode, like when you are the business owner and you own the business, I mean, you can just do whatever you want really. And so I tend to get a little creative with that. I'm very interested to hear how you made that work. So I know you took a little bit of a break um, or a little just tie a little slower time in business kind of once you got to Bali. So talk to me about like what type of pre-planning or like prep you did. What did it look like to get back into a schedule? How did you manage essentially being completely on the, I mean, other, the other side of the world from probably all, if not, you know, most of your clients? I'm excited to hear about all of the deeds. Yeah. um, So when I went to Bali end of January, I only carried over one client because I had a lot of clients who were booked in with me for like an eight week intensive that ended the middle of January. And that was very intentional. Like I planned that in October when I booked my ticket to Bali and I booked my clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I had one for continuity. She was honestly like my guinea pig. And I was like, you're going to help me test the Wi-Fi when I get there because I was so scared that I wasn't going to be able to find Wi-Fi anywhere in Bali, which is just so ridiculous. Like, Mm -hmm. it's fine. There's so many people that work online there. Like, it's fine. My Mm -hmm. first guest house I was in was great. There's a billion co-working places that you can buy a pass at if you need to. There's also a billion cafes that people just go and work at, have great Wi-Fi. But anyway, I carried one client over. We took a contracted out, like before we started working together, a two-week break for me to travel and settle because I hadn't never done this before I had no idea how exhausted I was going to be what my emotional state was going to be um if how long it was going to take me to find good wi-fi which was realistically about five minutes but um I was still (laughs) concerned about that before a lot of unknowns before you go oh yeah just carried the one over this time around when I go back in a month um I'm not even worried about it like it i I know where the good Wi-Fi spots are. Um, No, but I'm used to the travel at this point. Like, I'm not even worried about all of that. But those are the precautions I took going somewhere that I didn't know what to expect so much. And there's only so much you can plan with that. Like, I had all of those co-working places pinned on the map, but I had never been to them. So you can't, couldn't go until I was actually there. But yeah, I just carried one over. Um, I've had clients from all over the world for a while now ironically it's like as soon as I got to Bali all only Americans ended up working with me (laughs) everybody in like America and Canada and so I was like okay so we're going for like the tricky time zone like cool great because yeah I had to figure out what times I could take calls that also worked for my clients and I was really nervous about that 
Bali is 12 or 13 hours, depending on the time of year, because the U.S. changes their clocks um, different. And that actually works out pretty well as far as your sanity goes. Like as soon as it's 12 hours, that's so easy because it's like, oh, it's 8 p.m. for me. It's 8 a.m. for them. It's 7 a.m. for me. It's 7 p.m. for them. Super easy. Mm-hmm. Um, I say that now that it's been six months of me practicing it, but it's a lot of like mental math and using like those websites that will literally tell you like, okay, it's this time in this country. It's this time in that country. Um, those are super useful. Oh but yeah. yeah, I take calls for the most part. Like if it's an American or Canadian client or like anyone in the Western hemisphere in um, California to Eastern time, um, it's 12 to 15 hours. So it's pretty straightforward. Like I would take 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. calls. Like I would kind of work that like 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. time block. And then I would do like 8 a.m. to midnight, which I go to bed at like 1 a.m. anyway. So that's not that crazy for me, especially when you are living the life that you want to be living and you have, you know, really beautiful travel lifestyle in front of you. Like working till midnight one night a week isn't going to kill you. You know, it was worth it. It was very justifiable. Um, And yeah, I am not someone that naps. I think that's the hardest part. If I lie down to nap, I'm restless. Like I will not fall asleep. I just cannot for the life of me. Like it is really hard. I'm also not a caffeine person almost ever. Sometimes I'll have a matcha, but I'm not a coffee person. And so yeah, the sleep aids and the energy aids don't really work for me. Um, So that's tricky. But I think what was really important, and we talked about this before I left, was just being intentional about my schedule and like having time blocks for myself, essentially. And so if I worked until midnight, one night, not every week is perfect. Sometimes I did have to wake up early the next day, but ideally the next morning is that morning for me to sleep in. And if I'm waking up early, I'm trying not to have, you know, to take calls at 7, 8 a.m., I'm trying not to have calls that night too, because I don't nap. So that's a really long day for me. And I really want to be able to show up fully functional for my clients. So looking back on it now, like I've had six months to get used to it, but it's, it is like pretty straightforward. Some of those things you just can't master until you're actually there with the trial and error of experiencing it. The timing was not that big of a deal for me. I think the hardest thing is when you have bad Wi-Fi. And I made all those jokes about me being so afraid of bad Wi-Fi before I went um, because that first guest house I was in had great Wi-Fi. But like you are living in a third world country when you're, you know, in Southeast Asia. So there were times where like I had to cancel calls because like this just wouldn't really happen here unless we had like a proper hurricane. But like one day the power was just out for like half of my village. And so I went to my go-to spot, great Wi-Fi, always quiet, not a lot of people, free cafe, and they didn't have power. So no Wi-Fi. And then I went to my my backup, no power, no Wi-Fi. And then I went to the third place. And by the time I got to the third place, they had Wi-Fi, but I was so flustered. It was so close to the call that I had to push it because I just wasn't in that headspace. And that's really stressful. That unpredictability. Oh, I can literally the like visceral feeling I just can recall that so clearly the first like big Europe trip I did where I was working because I did my first ever backpacking for months at a time trip I was unemployed I was poor I was literally eating my husband and I were literally eating like the free food he would leave behind at the hostel like little box like mm, speaking of GI distress like oh my god but the first trip when I'm actually working Oh my God. And I was in Europe, so I didn't expect this. The Wi Fi. And it would be so insane because you're exhausted. You're trying to work these crazy hours, which I can totally relate. Like you said, it's not going to kill you to work till 12 or 1 or whatever you need to do one day a week to get to like live your dream for the rest of the days of the week and also probably that whole first half of that day. I'm down. Like, honestly, sign me up. But the Wi-Fi, it's it's such a helpless feeling and it's a helpless feeling for your only Wi-Fi to be at like a noisy, hectic cafe where you know it's going to impact the quality of the call for your client. I know you and I are both very conscientious of like quality of time with our clients. I, you know, when you're a good person and you're a good business owner, you care about quality. Um, and I don't, I think I've told you this story before, but 
the one of the worst experiences I've ever had with this. There were a couple, um, but one of them was with you. And I don't even know if you have I told you this about when I was in Greece talking to you. So you were my one on one client. OK, and it was like my it was my 25th birthday. I think it was like the day before, like the night before. So like it was turning over to my birthday. Anyways, I was saying I was in Greece and we had kind of checked like the Wi-Fi was supposed to be good. Um, my husband is not self-employed. He has a regular job. And so we was like not an option. So he ended up because our Wi-Fi was so crappy. He, I mean, I'm talking like three megabits per second. Like it was not workable. He's like working on the roof of this villa in Crete. We're praying to God it doesn't rain. He's like coding. He's like writing, you know, Python. And I have a call with you and I'm like, I'm going to be fine. The cameras are going to be off. I'm like, you remember you were writing your book, your passive in your book that you have. And I remember it was the call where I was like, we need to sell this. Like you need to put a price tag on this and you need to put it online and people will buy it passively. And I remember the Wi-Fi was so bad. The camera was off. I'm sure the quality was choppy. I was so determined to not cancel the call. In hindsight, I should have. I still think we covered everything. Some woman was yelling at me in Greek. Do what? <laughs> Um, do I don't think so. were you? No, this was different. This was different. Um, it's everywhere. Again, not a deterrent to not visit certain parts of the world. Um, but yeah, no, some lady was yelling at me in Greek because it was late at night and I was trying to have this call. And you get yourself into situations, and again, it is like the biggest call to action for anyone who like it's interested in being a digital nomad. Like, I swear you just have to speak up for yourself and like recognize when the quality is going to suffer to the point that you just need to like shift things around. And like the power that you feel as a business owner, when you're like, if I say we're moving the call, like we're moving the call, if I communicate and do what I need to do. So I totally feel for you on that. And I don't know, I, I only now <laughs> book Airbnbs if the host will speed test for me. And if they're like, I don't know how to do that. I'm like talking them through it. And if they can't figure it out, like I'm not staying there because yeah, literally I'm like, it's one button. It's right there. And if I go somewhere before I went to Bali and did I tell you this? Oh my God. No. So that first um, uh, guest house that I booked through Airbnb, I did that because you told me to. And I sent him the link and he did it. He sent me a screenshot and it, he didn't do it right. So it said that there was like no Wi-Fi, And I was like, is this right? Like, like, sir, you know. do you see the screen? <laughs> and he just goes, Wi-Fi is good enough here for Zoom. We aren't Singapore. It's like, sorry, because Singapore is Wait, super high tech and close by. Yeah, <sighs> Singapore is super high tech. But um, I was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Like, I've offended this man before I've even moved in. Like, <laughs> oh, my God, me. I'm like, Sarah, you have to do this. <laughs> like, Don't put one toe into the country before the speed test is complete. No, it's. It's a thing and you have to have like that sense of self-preservation too because it's so shitty to get in that position and realize like, oh my God, I've been on, um, I, I had a sales call once and I actually ended up closing the sale. It was fine, but the call was disconnecting. My husband was like asleep and, you know, he couldn't help me. And like, what do, what do you do? Do you say like I'm crammed into a corner of this like tiny Airbnb in someone's basement or do you like buck up and figure it out? So it's craziness but yeah that's just it's so relatable I know the feeling I know the feeling of taking a call in like a loud coffee shop and you're like I cannot do this so that is yeah very very relatable so I've started to lean in that direction because I had just like a policy where like I I've never been diagnosed with ADHD but I swear I have, I have a touch of something because if somebody's typing too loud over here and I'm like mm -hmm, sir you have to leave <laughs> Like, I think I'm as distracted as the person who I'm talking to can maybe hear what's going on. But no, um, I don't have a ton of experience with it. I've been recommended it a million times by my corporate friends. What is it? CRISPR is the... It's crisp. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. I don't know, like eight bucks a month maybe. And I would take these calls in Bali in this cafe that's usually really quiet. But sometimes someone's going to sit behind me and speak really loudly in Russian. And it is what it is. And so you can still hear it that's the thing is it doesn't cancel the noise for you and i really need like noise canceling headphones too yes but those are expensive um but you could layer these you could layer the ones you have on over a pair of airpod pros and it would probably cancel you enough 
it might mess with your speaker. It's hard to get the, the to strike the right balance. Um, but it's all just it's part of the game you play. And the 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 I think the moral of the story is like you need to stay somewhere that has good Wi-Fi. And if you find yourself in an emergency, you do what you did, which is you have your few places where where do I know there's going to be Wi-Fi, even if it's not perfect. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely it's relatable and it's funny I'll come home and be telling my my friends or my parents or whatever they're like what do you mean you're taking calls at you know one in the morning like it's this big self-sacrificial thing and I'm like what do you think I'm doing the rest of the week like I'm eating a croissant out of each hand like I'm good I'm fine um so that's my next question to you so how did you balance work and fun. I find that it's really tempting for me, at least in the beginning, before I had such a good balance, it was easy to get to where I was going and to kind of like, you know how some people will say they'll go travel and they'll have this like budget and then they get there. They're like, oh my God, you only live once, whatever, you know, comes back broke. For me, I think the timing budget and the fun budget, it was hard to balance. I was either so serious with work or I was so like, whatever, I obviously handle my immediate responsibilities, but anything additional is not getting done. And I finally figured it out after years, but the balance is hard. How did you balance it all? Cause I know you like, you were surfing, you made friends, like you had stuff going on. You were not just holed up in your, behind your computer. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, for context, I really didn't have that balance before I went to Bali because mm. I graduated into COVID and ended up stuck in my hometown unexpectedly and then in a relationship too in that same place. And so I love my hometown. It's beautiful. My parents are here, but I don't have friends here and I don't have yep. people with similar lifestyle or job structure as us. And so I worked like 10 hour days every single day because I had nothing else to do. And it's like, you know, I love my business. Like it was the beginning stages. There was plenty to be done, but I really didn't have the life side of it in that respect. And so I went to Bali and there's so much life that I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to work at all. So kind of ending up the other end of the other end of that spectrum was tricky. But um, yeah, as far as balancing it, I think that I'm really lucky that for the first time in my life, I had so many, not even just one or two, like so many friends who are business owners and they work online. And I'm like, you get it. We're going to like co-work together. And we're going to take time off together. Like we're going to hold each other accountable, but both to get shit done and to take rest days, like take time away. Um, and that's, what's really unique about Bali. Like that's why I've told you, you love it because it's a huge hub for digital nomads and just online, you know, transient people on people that work online. Um, even if they don't own their own business, like the amount of guys I met that are like, I work in tech and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so sick of hearing a man say that. But they can work online. So, you know, but they do have to get their work done. They're there to live. But yeah, Bali really gave me permission to transition from living to work to working to live, like working to fund my lifestyle. And that was just such a huge transition. So I had a one really good friend there who actually owns a supplement company for travelers. Like it's a travel supplement that is meant to stabilize you physically and mentally while you're traveling, which is just so cool in itself. Um, she's actually from Massachusetts too. So we're from like really close together, but we met in Bali and she was like the work hard, play hard friend that I needed where if I had a big project, which like during a launch or creating a resource, I need to sit down and I need to work a lot this week or I need to work a lot today and then tomorrow or next week, she's going to like F off work with me and we're going to go have a great time. And that was a really nice, like, privilege to have people that were on the same wavelength as me where they didn't only work all the time and they didn't they weren't only on vacation too so I mm -hmm. think that that's really important to have friends that are living the same lifestyle as you like I didn't realize how much I I missed it until I had it again and I was like wow I have people with similar schedules in the sense that we're going to wake up tomorrow and decide when we want to start working like most people don't have that luxury like I feel like I'm the only one when I'm home and mm -hmm. Sometimes that means I don't start working until 2 p.m. Sometimes that means I don't stop working until 2 a.m. But having people that are doing the same thing alongside you makes it so much easier. As far as um, just like having so much stimulating me, like so many things I wanted to be doing, 
I think that being in the situation where I'm living the life that is so true to me, whether that's, you know, Bali for me or Europe for you or being a stay-at-home mom for somebody else, like that makes you have even more passion for your business because you're like, this is what allows me to have this life. Like, oh, Mm -hmm. I don't want to work because I want to go surfing. But if I work, I can go surfing more. I can afford more lessons. I can afford to take more time off because I'm hiring people. Like if I grow here, I can live my life around this or live, you know, have this fit in around my life really. So yeah, it's, it's not, it wasn't too tricky for me. It was definitely a big adjustment and it's learned over time, but I wouldn't describe it as like impossible at all. No. And I think you said it perfectly. I was just recording another podcast. Um, I was doing an advanced recording for my like birthday episode for next month and talking about a big lesson that I've learned. And it was exactly what you said, that when you learn to work to create the lifestyle you want to have, whether that's the funding, the time flexibility, the people around you, whatever it is, when you do that instead of working and fitting your life in around that, like your world, it's like it explodes. Like it, it there's so much more that you have access to opportunity wise, like mentally. I think it's the coolest thing. I don't think it has to be something that's like reserved for business owners only, but for business owners, like it is just as easy to like F off and not do your work as it is to stay locked behind your laptop and not get out and do fun things because you feel guilty or you don't know how to have fun because you've been in your grinding stage for, you know, too many years or too many months. So finding that balance, like I think it kind of takes going somewhere where it's so tempting to get out and do stuff, but to also have fostered discipline in yourself already. Like it is like the perfect combination. So you were in a great spot, I think, having been in business, like very seriously, very focused for like year, year and a half to like go have some fun. Like you're good. Have fun. You know what you need to do for work. You get to a place really where your work doesn't take you as long as it used to. And you don't also have to keep adding new stuff. Like that's such a revelation to, and I I think that's kind of how we'll segue into this next piece, talking about your business and the evolution of that. But realizing like, I don't always have to be adding something new constantly. And I also am a lot faster or I have someone helping me with other stuff. So I just have more time and it all comes a little bit easier. And I think that's so magical. Let's talk about, to kind of round things out here, I know you had mentioned to me that you're in kind of an evolutionary like period in your business. I I think you just said like that you are maybe restructuring a few things and looking to maybe do some outsourcing. So I would say like this would be a great time if you want to like just tell me what's kind of whatever you're comfortable sharing as far as like that goes. Also like I have a little bit of like a passion for outsourcing. Like I love it. I've been doing it since before I think I was ready to, but it changed my life to like have that. So I'm happy to offer input wherever I can, but yeah, what's your like vision for business now that you're, now that you're back? Yeah. So I have the immense privilege of having a growing audience on social media. I mostly use TikTok and Instagram. I'm very passionate about having a genuine connection with my audience. I think that 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 is why, even though I have more followers than I used to, people still feel like they actually know me because I I am in my DMs. Like if you get a DM for me, I am the one answering it. Like I am very, I answer all my comments. Like I write all my captions and it's me. And that's really important to me. But as my community grows, I feel like content creation takes like 70% of my time. Mm-hmm. Part of that is my own fault because I have so many things I want to share. Like I have so many things I want to say. And I feel like I just am spending so much time trying to keep up with the messages, the comments, the engagement, all of the things that people say about the algorithm and then the physical creation, which I do enjoy. Like I have always been a I'd love to take pictures. I love to take videos. I'd love to be creative. Like I do enjoy it. But when mm-hmm. it becomes like so much of my time that I start to dread the other tasks in my business and I'm tired and I'm, I even get burnt out from content creation, which I do enjoy. That's when I know that I'm doing too much and I'm spending too much time on it. So I'm outsourcing 
a couple parts of the process. Um, I'm, I don't even know if you would call this like outsourcing because it's not to a specific person, but I've been learning a lot more about AI tools to help me edit faster, to transcribe videos. Um, I've also been putting a lot of time and thought and effort into the flow of my business, like the flow of content creation and how that converts to sales. Like I'm going to film a video. It's going to be about a certain topic. We're going to pull clips for social media. And then we're also going to use the transcript to write a email and that newsletter is going to convert to sales by selling this and having this goal. But that's a big system to be like conceptualizing in your brain and trying to put onto paper. So it's been taking me a couple months, honestly, of like recognizing that I need this and that I need other eyes on it because having someone else's input and opinion and knowledge is so valuable when you have the right person, mm -hmm. especially when you own your own business. Like, you can get so in your head so easily. Like you overthink all the time because you are just thinking all the time. Um, so yeah, I'm in a period of transition of hiring a copywriter and I think I'm going to use mostly AI for video editing, but I was exploring hiring a video editor. I was exploring hiring a just um, marketing manager because I don't want to be managed. Like I have some friends that are just like full on influencers. They're not coaches, but they have the similar followings to me or greater followings. And they have a manager in the sense that they have someone that kind of tells them what to do. And I knew I didn't mm -hmm. want that, but I wanted like a strategist. Like I wanted someone to help me put together a full marketing plan. And I've kind of ruled out that need because once I get a lot of the copywriting done, then it's going to just free up so much of my time and energy and I'll reassess from there. But yeah, I think the hardest part about the process is, is a, just like understanding what you need. And that takes time. Like that takes patience. It takes trial and error. I do feel like I really understand it now, which is good. But the other hard part is hiring someone to help you make more money before you're making that money. Because then it's mm -hmm. like, well, I need to hire them in order to grow like I recognize I only have so many hours I have to hire someone if I want to grow at this point I've kind of like hit the barrier of what I can do on my own and they'll help me make more money but I'm not making that money yet so paying them makes me nervous and so it's that like kind of that cycle yep. and mm -hmm. you know we do a lot to have income continuity like payment plans and planning our years out and planning launches but at the end of the day like I have some months where my income is way higher than others. So there is a lot of flexibility there that can make it a little nerve wracking too. Oh yeah, for sure. Oh my gosh. The catch 22 like thought process or like a moment for all business owners is okay. I need to spend some money to make some money, but it's, and it's like that cycle. And so it, yeah, just taking the leap when you've done the research, like that's the thing is a lot of people will just, decide to outsource or purchase pre-done this or you know there's all kinds of things you can buy that are going to help you so much once you've done your research correctly like you've already separated yourself and then you can pretty confidently and like with the knowledge that you've done your due diligence you can take the leap and generally it pays off because you have the data to support like you already have a business you have data to pull from I'm a big proponent of outsourcing I think that like you said, there's a point where like you are doing everything that you can do and you can push yourself over the edge to be like hyper productive or you can like enjoy your life. You know, you can have a business and have a life and like there are other people out there who their job is to take things off your plate and it's a really cool ecosystem you can build. Um, but no, I mean, I, I think outsourcing is like literally – so important. It can be scary, but also like you are responsible. You're smart. You will make a decision about the investment that is not going to put you in like the danger zone or anything like that. So I think that you have, you can have a level of inner peace about the whole thing just because you're a smart business owner with experience and that, you know, really, I mean, there's no substitute for that. So I'm proud of you. I think that is a huge step in the right direction. And I was smiling when you were talking about, you know, wrapping your mind around the whole like flow of business. And it is such a crazy thing to wrap your mind around. And it feels so like looming when you start that process of like, okay, I have so many things going on. I need to really like 
you know, bring it all together. I need to loop it all in and leave buy a poster board because I'm very oh, yeah. visual. I had to buy a poster board and like like big piece of paper draw it out. Like to yes. understand. Yeah. Oh yeah. I feel like the visualization is huge. Um I'm very like I I really love personally like the funnel shape and understanding how that works. And then you have your cycles of product um and your sales loops and everything kind of within that. But I think that's really important to stop and take the time to do that. And honestly, it will not be the last time you do it. You think you're good and you are good, but it's so important to stay like looped in in your own business and to know what what's working, what's not working, what you want to rinse and repeat. And so I think I'm a huge proponent of getting it all on paper out in front of you. What am I selling like, what am I doing? You know, sometimes we get so just in it in the day to day, like, okay, I need to post this. I need to talk to this client. I know generally what my yearly schedule looks like, but on a deeper level or even like a more just bird's eye view type of perspective, you can get a little lost in the weeds unless you take a second to like really map it all out. So very good use of your time. I do that frequently. I would even say quarterly, not because I schedule it in quarterly. I probably should, but just organically, I get to that period of like, I need to set myself straight and reassess what's going on. Um, and I have found, I don't know if you would agree that that process oftentimes allows you to like trim the excess off. It's like rather than that feeling like you have to add things to your plate, um, which when that happens, you can always outsource. That's a great opportunity to do that. But it also allows you to see like redundancy. Where can I take something away? Am I spending time on something that is literally yielding nothing? And I could rededicate that to my highest performer. So it's a good practice for anyone. I even think people who work in, in corporate and who have goals, like I just figure out what the heck you're doing and eliminate the extras and focus in on what is propelling you forward because otherwise you're going to stand still. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's challenging too as like, like it challenges the business owner side of me because the, again, the content creation side comes naturally. The the connection side comes naturally, like connecting with people online, um, whether that's in the messages or like through the content I create. And then the business owner side of me is like, you have to get to a certain point where you're not answering every DM or you're not writing every single Instagram caption or email. Like I'm not sacrificing the whole, the whole picture. Like I'm still going to have oversight and edit and be the one that really gives the, the go ahead on all of it. But yeah, it's hard to remind myself, like sometimes it's more, it's necessary so that I can keep showing up as the coach, as the friend, as the person that cares for me to outsource. And that feels counterintuitive sometimes and it's hard, but it's, it's shown me like it's absolutely essential. Oh I yeah, absolutely. Like, they just don't have enough. Yeah. There's not enough time in the day and there you deserve to have time in the day that's dedicated to things that aren't your business. I believe in that fully. Um, I, I really, I just think like, unless you, we're out here trying to be the next, you know, Steve Jobs or, you know, whoever our Mr. Silicon Valley tech boy of the future is going to be like, I really think that it's, it's work and you have to have life too. And integrating people in area in specialized areas to allow you to do that is really important. So yeah, I'm like, I'm always here. Of course, if you ever, you know, like get a little boost of just like, just do it you'll be so grateful that you did because I really do believe in it and think that it can be so life-changing. Um, but that's honestly everything that I had on my kind of agenda for today. I really appreciate you coming on. And I was so eager to catch up with you that I was like, this will be fun even just to um, just sit down together and catch up. But so you said you're going back to Bali. So like, do you have, what's like your, what's the future as far as you know it looking like for you digital nomad wise? It lies ahead for me. Yeah. Um, so it's the third week of August while we're recording this. So I'll be gone, headed back to Bali in about three and a half weeks, I think. Um, I think that's, yeah, one, two, yeah, three, four max. Um, I've been home for a month, so that's right along the timeline I was planning on. Um, I haven't bought a ticket yet. I 
stay being a last minute girly when it comes to buying. Well, the first ticket I bought to Asia was very far in advance because I was so stoked. But when I came back this time um, to America, I bought it like five days before I left because it was so expensive that I was like, I just don't want to have to do it. Um, and as soon as I book it, I know exactly when I'm traveling. So it's like on my mind. So I just wait as long as possible so that I can be present. But um, I need to buy that ticket soon. It'll be for the middle of September. And I will go back. I debated um, traveling along the way. I debated going to a different country first. But I think that what makes the most sense for me right now with clients I will have and also just like traveling logistically like with more stuff this time because I'm not going to take the whole backpacking vibe I'm gonna go straight to Bali um get settled for a bit every two months I'll have to do a visa run so I'm gonna try and be more intentional with those visa runs make them proper trips to different countries because last time I just like did a 24 hour in Singapore type of deal that's kind of like the classic visa run there um, so yeah, I'm hoping to use Bali as like a home base for a little bit longer. I don't see Bali as somewhere that I'm like moving and I'm going to live there forever. When I am traveling, I'm a slow traveler. So I used to do the whole, like go to a different country in Europe every single weekend. Um, and I respect that version of myself, but I can't do that anymore. It's too fast. Um, I like to be places for for a long time to really experience it get settled so I don't feel like I'm done in Bali yet I think I'll be there for maybe another six months maybe a year depending on how much I go to other places and how long I go to those places for um, but yeah that's the plan for the near future it's strange knowing that I probably won't be back in this country for like at least nine months maybe more because I it's August and I part of the reason I live in Bali is because I hate being cold I <laughs> love where I grew up but I hate being here in the winter and that rules out you know me coming home until April and then mm -hmm. even at that point like it, it doesn't really make sense for me to come home until later in the summer and you know in proper summer and if I do see my parents, they might meet me halfway. And, you know, my dad's from England. So I might just go to England instead of coming to America. So that's really weird to know. Last time I traveled, I didn't know what lay ahead of me. I didn't know when I was coming home. I didn't know it would be six months. Now that I have more of a plan, it's it's very strange, but I'm so excited to be back there. Like, I just feel so enabled and at home there. So that's what's yeah. next for me travel-wise. That is really exciting. I'm, yeah, I'm super excited to keep up with all that. And I told everyone already on my little intro that I did before we hopped on where they can find you. But you said your main platforms are Instagram and TikTok, both at Sarah in Yellow. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. This was a really, really fun chat. And I know we're going to hop off and talk for a second about uh, the call you're hosting with all my girls um, in just a little bit. Um, but thank you so much. And after your next big stint of travels, we'll have to have another love update from you. So can't wait. Um, film live if you come visit me because I will be there. Oh my God. Okay. I'll come visit you. <laughs> just say less. I, I tell people I'm like, careful where you invite me because I, be, I do be perusing the flights with it's they're expensive they will not there will not be <laughs> she's like and don't wait for them to drop because they're <laughs> they won't they won't um maybe like because one random day in october i was like should i stay an extra month to save 200 bucks and i was like mm, no i gotta go but oh no, yeah no it's, yeah maybe i'll i'll um i'll have you come visit me though because that would be amazing you would love um that would be great. I'll bring you a few of your down. I'll bring you a few Trader Joe's snacks of choice in exchange. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, love you the most. Thank you for being here. And you guys subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. Love you guys too. We'll see you in the next one. Bye. <laughs>